Hey guys, welcome back to another Typhoon H video. Um, in this video, we're definitely going to be taking a look at the Typhoon H Plus again, but in the future, I'm going to be making more Typhoon H videos or videos that apply to both of them. So that's coming in the future. In the meantime, I've really been wanting to work with this to get it worked into my routine, so I've been spending a lot of time with it. Currently, I have 62 flights for 992 flight minutes or just under 17 hours of flight time. So I'm really getting familiar with it, but there's still things I'm learning about it. And so I wanted to make a video that shows some of the inner workings of the ST16S and in particular the ST16S interface with all these different icons up here, uh, the menus on the ST16. So we're going to do that right now. Stick around. More to come. Okay. Um, because the ST16S is so different than the standard ST16 with the Typhoon 480, um, the whole interface here is completely different. Everything is in different places. So I thought I'd take a minute and just do a run through of everything that's on the home screen. Now some of these icons are interactive and when you touch them they open up other menus. And we'll look at that too. But for right now, let's just go line by line and see what everything is here on the uh, ST16S. We'll do that right now. All right. Let's take a look at all the sections of the ST16S screen on a one by one basis, starting up here at the very top. Now the first icon we see is the History Notes icon. Next is the Flight Mode icon. This indicates whether you're in Angle, Manual, Home, and then there is also the Sport and Smart Modes. Then you have the satellites connected to the controller. 1 through 5 will show in red, 6 to 10 in yellow, and 11 and above will be in green. Satellites on the aircraft, same thing. Moving on, we have the 2.4 and 5.8 GHz signal strength indicators. Next, we see the aircraft and controller battery level indicators here and here. And finally, we see the settings icon there on the far right. Now below this, we have the camera settings and information bar. This is self-explanatory as we have the ISO, shutter speed, exposure value, white balance, metering, and the remaining storage left on the SD card displayed in this section. Okay, moving on, here on the right we have the camera controls and at the top is a selector switch to choose between the photo and video modes. Then we have the record and shoot buttons. Below that we have the camera settings icon and then at the bottom is the gallery menu button. And over on the far right is the gimbal tilt indicator. At the very bottom there is the distance and height in relation to takeoff point and below that is the vertical and horizontal speeds as well as a mission timer. Now finally on the left, we have the task and takeoff or landing icons, and at the very top is the heading and attitude indicator. Okay, now that we've seen um, what all the icons on the screen mean, some of these are interactive and they lead us into sub-menus. So we're going to go through those one by one and we're going to start with the history notes right here on the top. History notes is simply a listing of all of the messages that have been flashed on the screen as well as any warnings that may have been issued during previous flights. The settings icon allows access to the main menus. First is the aircraft tab and here you can select the maximum altitude, change flight modes, turn on or off the LEDs or the GPS, and also access the calibration menus. Next is the controller tab and here you can select the controller mode or view the RC or hardware monitor, which is useful to make sure all the controls and switches are working correctly. The next tab is the binding tab, where you can bind to the aircraft and to the camera. And finally, there is the General Settings tab. This is where you can check for and download firmware updates. Now, we'll cover this in another video. Moving on to the Camera Control section, at the top you have the Mode Selector to switch between Photo or Video, but you can also switch modes by pressing either of the buttons on the camera which will switch to the corresponding mode. Now, that's pretty handy. The Camera Settings menus are fairly intuitive and well laid out. So navigating to the section you want to change is straightforward. However, if I have one gripe about the interface, it is that at times the touchscreen can get a little finicky and when you're in the field, this can make even slight adjustments tedious. Now you'll notice when switching into photo mode, there is an additional icon that will appear on the screen. This will allow you to select the type of photo mode you want, uh, such as single, burst, time lapse, and so on. And finally, at the bottom is the gallery icon. Tapping this will open a folder which will contain low-res versions of all of your recent photos and videos, and this is kind of handy if you're in the field and you want to check your work.
Okay guys, we're out here at the field and we're going to run through some of these um, automated flight modes and things uh, such as automatic takeoff, automatic landing. They're, they're actually pretty good. But uh, first I'm going to run through the new smart mode. They brought that back so that you can actually go into the controller and turn on smart mode which kind of replaces sport mode momentarily. But they have made it a little safer for, for newcomers and people that aren't used to how this thing works. So we're just going to run through this real quick how to turn it on and how it works. Stick around. Smart mode on the Typhoon H Plus is similar to that of the Typhoon 480, but it does have a few extra safeties built in. Now, smart mode still puts an 8 meter perimeter around the controller and pilot, but to activate this mode on the Plus, you must have at least 11 satellites connected to the controller and the aircraft has to be outside of the smart circle. Only at this point can you turn on smart mode by first activating it in the settings menu, then by selecting the top position of the flight mode switch. That is how it works in theory. In reality, the GPS fix on the controller can be in a different spot than where you are actually standing. This is also true with the GPS fix on the aircraft, so how can you be sure that you have enough distance? When using smart mode, always look at the distance that is displayed on the controller, as this is what smart mode is using for its calculations. When you're ready to fly, open the aircraft tab in the settings menu and activate smart mode. Then, you can flip the mode switch to the top position and you'll get a note that the aircraft is in smart mode and the flight mode icon will be green. Once in flight, the aircraft will stop at the 26 foot perimeter and come no closer. You are now in what Unique calls headless control. So, what is that? Essentially, the aircraft's heading no longer matters as to which direction it will move. What matters is the direction between the aircraft and the controller. Moving the right stick forward will cause the aircraft to fly away from you along this path regardless of which way it is pointed, out to the maximum distance allowed. And pulling the right stick back will cause the aircraft to return along this path until it reaches the safe zone, then it will stop. Moving the right stick to the right or left will cause the aircraft to move accordingly, however, it will do so at whatever distance it is from the controller in a continuous circle. Essentially, what you have here is a manual version of Orbit Me, with one caveat. The aircraft heading does not change. Notice in this example that as the plus goes around me, it stays pointed in one direction. And as you may expect, even if one were to apply yaw, the result would be that the aircraft will rotate in the yaw axis as it flies. Now I don't know of any practical purpose for such maneuvering, but it will make any other drone pilot that happens to see you think, you're pretty good on the sticks. The auto takeoff and landing mode of the Typhoon H Plus works about as well as one could hope for. All actions from motors on to lift off and back are deliberate and well executed and new flyers may even prefer this over manual takeoff and landings as it negates any possibility of a tip over. Another method I have been using is simply to launch and recover by hand. This technique will allow you to take off and recover in areas where level or unobstructed surface is unavailable, such as the side of a hill, high grass, rocky terrain, or other unsuitable areas for takeoffs and landings. Now speaking of areas you don't want to fly, you may have noticed I'm flying at a new location. You might call it a swamp, and while it does have alligators and snakes and just about everything else you don't want to come in contact with, this is actually our club field. It used to be a horse racing track years ago, but now it is the home of the Oviedo Model Airplane Club, and I'm its newest member, and I'm just excited to have a place where I can go and fly without any people around. Well, that's about all the time I have for this video. I want to thank you guys for watching and thanks for subscribing. More videos are in the works as always, and we'll see you in the next one. See you then.